These are incredibly powerful storms that can change your life forever. It's right there. It's right there, go, go, go. I was in the kitchen and all of a sudden my mother screamed, Cyprian, come and look what's happening outside. That was about seven o'clock. When we saw the people on the beach, we noticed injuries to heads, hands, shoulders, all over the body of the people that were hurt by those hailstones. World's wildest weather, catastrophic and strange weather events from around the globe, filmed on camera by those caught up in the chaos. Expert meteorologists explain the causes behind the events and show us why our weather is becoming so challenging and life-threatening. Our weather patterns are becoming so much more erratic and unpredictable. Springtime in Germany should be a gentle time as the sun begins to shine and the flora starts to grow. At the end of May 2016, southern Germany was experiencing a very different type of spring. The water arrived in just a few minutes. Everyone saw the water. It was really hard and fast and no one could do anything about it. It was clear in that moment that it was a catastrophe, a disaster. I could see that, and it was so obvious that it was going to be really bad. The rains were relentless. The rivers swelled, and then came the flash flooding, which led to a devastating event in Brownsbark. A persistent weather system lingered over the southeast region of Germany in late May 2016, causing multiple thunderstorms to pummel the region. My name's Cyprian Koras, and I'm 21 years old. I came with my family to Germany in 2015. Frank Harsh is the mayor of Brownsbach. I was here in the town hall, in my office, to do a few things. It was a Sunday evening, and I was sorting out a few things on the computer. Brownsbach is located in a valley in the mountainous part of Baden-Württemberg. The town is close to one of the highest bridges in Germany, over the River Karcher, which runs through the town. But the river wasn't the cause of the massive devastation to come. On the 29th of May, it was sunny all day long. I had studied and stayed at home all day. People were outside enjoying the sunshine. Then all of a sudden, about 6 or 6.30, it started to rain. The rainfall was incredibly hard and heavy. Now let's talk numbers here. The amount of rainfall over 24 hours was around 122 millimetres. Now on the face of it, well, it's quite common to see that amount of rainfall. But looking at the intensity actually fell in a space of hours, not days. And that's where the trouble lay. The power of such an amount of water is totally off the scale. In fact, when calculations were done after the event, it turned out that this rainfall event in itself happens one in every 3,000 years. My grandmother lived close to here in Brownsbach. She called us and said the water was rising in her village, which is an even smaller place than here. And she wanted to know if the water was affecting us too. There are many small streams in the area running off the hillside. These are normally gentle trickles, but the intense rainfall was turning them into a raging torrent, threatening to deluge the area. And some of these intense thunderstorms rained over the mountainous area 
of southern Germany. 48 separate landslides were calculated and in its wake lay the town of Brownsbach. Uh, I was in the kitchen and all of a sudden my mother screamed, Cyprium, come and look what's happening outside. That was about seven o'clock. The town was reeling under the heavy rainfall, but the devastating effect of the flash flooding was yet to come. Hurricane season in the United States rips into the coastal regions of the Gulf of Mexico from June to November. 2005 will go down in history as a record-breaking hurricane season. Peaking with Katrina during August, which became one of the worst natural disasters ever to happen in the USA. That's the neighbor's house. 200 miles of coastline became a water world from the eastern side of Louisiana to the Florida Panhandle. A hurricane is defined by having sustained wind speeds of 74 miles per hour or greater. So 74 mile per hour wind speed alone is going to be dangerous because there'll be flying debris. We know it's enough to do damage to less well-built structures, but it's more than wind. Hurricanes typically bring very heavy rainfall with them and also surge if you're along the coastlines. That's water from the ocean itself moving inland with the forward momentum of this hurricane as it's making landfall. A tropical storm was being tracked off the coast of the Bahamas with a wind speed of 40 miles per hour ominously building in the Atlantic Ocean. But no one knew if it would become a hurricane and whether it would hit land and how hard it would hit. The early life of Katrina was very uncertain. As it ambled towards the Bahamas, the sea surface temperatures were around 27 degrees Celsius. Now, hurricanes are fueled by very warm seas, and this was one of the key elements that allowed Katrina to intensify over the next few days. As it gained momentum and increased to a Cat 1 hurricane, Katrina pushed towards the coast, accelerating up to a Cat 5 hurricane. In New Orleans on the 28th of August, a warning was issued. Devastating damage expected. And with that, 80% of the population left the city. That was over a million people. But the 20% who decided to stay, well, the results were inevitable. New Orleans is surrounded by water on practically all sides by the huge Mississippi River, Lake Pontrachain, and the Gulf of Mexico. The city was supposedly protected by large levees which kept back the flow of the Mississippi. But it was known for many years that these were inadequate in the face of a large storm front. As the warnings rang out, people knew that they needed to get away from this disaster waiting to happen. Hurricane Katrina made impact along the United States Gulf Coast, impacting Louisiana, Mississippi directly. Oh man, I do not want to see what New Orleans looks like right now. But it carried with it a Category 5 type storm surge. So it had that forward momentum and it hit a part of the coast that was already susceptible to flooding and didn't have the type of ability to stop that wall of water, which was 20 feet or, or bigger in some cases. Look how deep that is. Oh my God. Storm surge is something that will vary depending upon the angle that the hurricane hits the coastline and also the type of coastline. If you're looking at, say, the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf Coast, it's a really slow slope from the ocean up to the coast itself, which means there's not a whole lot to stop that surge. The region is hugely vulnerable with extensive parts actually below sea level. So this storm surge was going to be deadly. In the Gulf Coast of the United States, there used to be a lot of mangrove forests, and those mangroves, those trees, would help to serve as a spongy catch for some of the surge that would come in. But development over decades has cut down a lot of those mangroves, so now you have very vulnerable coastline without the root systems in place and the swampy areas to catch, to serve as that sponge. 
The city of New Orleans had been ordered to evacuate with just 60 hours notice. Over one million people were in the path of Hurricane Katrina. No doubt the wind and the rain brought a huge amount of damage to the area, particularly the rainfall as Katrina made landfall and tracked northeastwards across the states. When this massive weather phenomenon finally hit land, the consequences were catastrophic. But it was the record storm surge where many lives were lost. The thing has floated up the side. It's over the mailbox. This is about 30 feet already, isn't it? The storm surge associated with Katrina was 10 metres. Unimaginable. It was estimated that 100,000 people were stuck in New Orleans as Katrina hit. Some chose to stay, and many were unable to leave. Oh, man, we haven't got no eye. You've got to be kidding me. Holy shit. That's the Gulf of Mexico. We're just walking yeah. through water in the, in the library. The vast majority of New Orleans, Louisiana is underwater. Tens of thousands of homes and businesses are beyond repair. A lot of the Mississippi Gulf Coast has been completely destroyed. Mobile is flooded. We are dealing with one of the worst natural disasters in our nation's history. Hurricane Katrina ravaged the Gulf Coast for three days, affecting 90,000 square miles and demanding the largest deployment of the National Guard in American history. New Orleans was always going to be at risk from flooding. It's surrounded by water, and even though some of the city is above sea level, the average elevation is six feet below sea level. Anybody picking this up? Nearly 1,500 people died in the tragedy, and in New Orleans, the majority of those who perished were over 70 years old. There was a tragic loss of life. The region was totally obliterated. There was 108 billion US dollars worth of damage, with over one million homes wrecked. The force of the devastation was unimaginable. On a scale of hurricanes, Katrina was absolutely huge. And up to the point of August 2005, it was the fourth most intense hurricane ever to hit the shores of the USA. The evacuation of over 480,000 people from New Orleans in less than a few hours was impossible. And as Katrina swept in, it became the costliest disaster in US history. The southwest area of Germany was being hammered by multiple thunderstorms and excessive rainfall patterns during early 2016. And these intense weather events were causing problems all over southern Germany. It started to rain at 6.30 in the evening, and by 8 o'clock, the flood had arrived. It was really bad. Everyone could see the water, but no one could do anything about it. Everything happened very fast, practically in a matter of a few moments. Of course, it all started with the rain, then later on the flood came suddenly. Then came the mud, all like dirty water, and then came the cars and the rubble. The whole thing happened within, I'd say, between an hour, an hour and a half. The flood happened very fast. So it was the intensity of rain, the amount of rain in a short period of time, and in one spot it was measured as 90 millimetres in just one hour. Brown's bark, translated into English, means brown creek. The usually gentle stream surrounding the town 
were now at breaking point. There was no warning and no information to alert us of this, to warn us what might be about to happen. It was completely unexpected. The floods arrived at night with its life-threatening debris, that's rocks, boulders and muddy sediments, all surging on the town. It was chaotic and it was destructive. It had so much energy, we did not actually realise what was happening. In the flood waters we could see trees, cars, boulders. We were really unsure if people were safe, but we couldn't see anyone in the flood water. So, it was raining really heavily and the flooding on the street was very strong. So anyone on the streets would have been washed away by the flood. It was absolutely life-threatening. My parents were very afraid, and me too. But what can you do if such a natural disaster arrives? My parents were on the second floor, and I was on the first floor. The tenant who used to live with us was on the ground floor, and we were all in the attic within minutes. Of course I was scared, and you feel like you're completely paralysed, because there is absolutely nothing you can do at that moment, except just wait. People were forced to stay in the back of their houses, to escape. Some people even climbed onto the roofs. We had one case where a man was in his car, he was trapped in his car. The flood water took him away and spat him out again, as you would say, three kilometers downstream. A lot of calculations have been done, and it's been worked out that in some places the water in the rubble which was left was five to eight meters high. The flash flooding brought with it 50,000 tons of debris, crashing into the small town of Braunsbach with just a population of 924. Can you imagine? Rubble three, four, five meters high. What this means just physically to carry so much material. That's gigantic. A gigantic amount of rocks, boulders. That's unbelievable, unimaginable. And apart from that, of course, it's been estimated that 180 litres of water per square metre flowed. It's an enormous amount of water. So, first of all, we have to say that there have been no deaths to report. And this is the most important thing. Remarkably, there was no loss of life. But the 924 residents suffered in many other ways. My parents worked almost their whole lives to buy a house and it was very sad for them. Many houses were completely demolished, and in many cases the insurance didn't cover all the damage. I think this is very sad, especially for the older people who can no longer live in their own homes. There was damage in the private sector, but also in the public sector. The infrastructure such as roads and the sports centre and the town hall. But the damage in total, as it stands today, about 80 million euros. Well, the actual disaster cleaning up phase, so the days after the catastrophe and the removal of all the rubbish and debris, took about, I'd say, three months. And everything after is classed as reconstruction, and that is up to five years. 
We have to say clearly it was a catastrophe, and we have managed the catastrophe here. We did incredibly well, all of us together. I've never seen anything like it with my own eyes, and I never want to see it again if possible. Life-changing events can happen in the blink of an eye, without any warning, and the damage and aftermath can last for years. The USA has an extensive history of tornadoes. The destruction they can cause is legendary, and the El Reno tornado was on an unprecedented scale. You may have watched The Wizard of Oz, where there's a tornado in the story, but these things are real, and they kill people. It's right there. It's right there. Go, go, go. It was a big tornado, multi uh, vortices, uh, F3. Oh, look at that. We realized we were in serious danger when everything around us was completely black. The rain was blinding, and there was debris flying around us and hitting our car. We weren't sure we were going to make it out alive. El Reno, which is in Oklahoma, it's west of Oklahoma City. So again, we're back into this geographically targeted area for tornadoes. The El Reno tornado happened on a day that there was already other thunderstorms going on. And it was after a couple of days of really tough, severe weather and other tornadoes that were battering parts of the plains. So this is day three of a rough round of severe weather. Significant tornado here. Uh, now coming into downtown Oklahoma City, and we're talking about uh, just about two miles now. You really don't know exactly where they're going to hit or when or anything like that. But when the conditions are, are ripe for a, a big tornado, you just feel it in the air. I mean, you can feel the humidity and the, the, the stickiness of the atmosphere, and you, you can just feel it. You just know that something's coming. Eleven days earlier, the town of Moore had suffered major damage from an EF5 tornado. Twenty-four people had died, and the region seemed ripe for the formation of another huge tornado. But now you're on day three and you get all these subtle little boundaries, these subtle differences between uh, wind shifts that happen at the ground left over from the previous day's dead thunderstorms. So now you get these other little subtle boundaries that can serve as trigger points. It's almost like you're recycling the same moisture and the same mess over and over again each day. Greg Winters, superintendent of the Canadian Valley Tech Center, had hundreds of students in his charge. The tornadoes in Oklahoma are very commonplace, and, and, and that's unfortunate. I mean, that's just what we live with. We live with tornadoes, and that's just kind of part of it. And you do get a little bit desensitized. When we have tornadoes coming through, we have our TV stations have helicopters flying in the air, uh, live shots, video uh, live shots of tornadoes. It's almost like we watch tornado coverage in the spring of the year in Oklahoma like we watch athletic events. We were watching the news reports, uh, the Weather Channel, and we were just trying to be prepared to respond should uh, there be an outbreak of tornadoes. The whole region is known as Tornado Alley due to the crazy weather conditions which allow the formation of so many huge and devastating tornadoes. So each year I go out in search of some of the craziest weather, not just here in Oklahoma, but across the entire United States. Brandon Sullivan is a storm chaser and meteorologist. So this was about a week and a half after the devastating Moore, Oklahoma tornado. So the entire state of Oklahoma was already focused on severe weather and you know tornadoes and even disaster recovery inside of central Oklahoma. When I went to lunch, uh, I ran into these gentlemen that were storm chasers and they told me uh, that the conditions were absolutely perfect for a large tornado and that I need to get back, send everybody home and, and uh, get ready, brace ourselves for, for a big event because it was coming. And what was coming was the widest tornado ever recorded, at 2.6 miles wide. Here it comes, here it comes. Right behind those tanks to the left. Hold on, I'm getting nervous. I'd already seen a number of tornadoes uh, in that May. Uh, it was a very active season. 
Storm chasers absolutely serve an important purpose. They are the eyes on the ground closest to the storm to let us know in real time, what do you see, what's actually happening? They provide what's called ground truth. They're on the ground, they're able to tell the meteorologist back in the studio or back in the office, yes, what you're seeing on radar is absolutely true. I can see the tornado, it's all the way touching the ground. Or when it lifts back up, nope, it's no longer in contact with the ground. So they provide that real time live feed, if you will, of what's happening. So as the storm developed, we were probably 10 to 15 miles to the south, just watching and waiting. Um, yeah, we like to sit outside and try to avoid any hail and really don't try to get close to the storm until it's time to produce a tornado. Once I talked to the storm chasers, I came back to the campus, gave a direct order to send everybody home. Uh, we didn't know for sure if the tornado was going to hit or not, uh, but the conditions were absolutely perfect for a big tornado. That's pretty impressive. The widest ever recorded tornado was on a collision course with the Canadian Valley Tech. All over the globe, freaky weather events can both endanger and surprise us. The world has seen unusual changes in our weather patterns. Strange spherical objects floating in a lake, snow on holiday beaches, humongous hailstones. In 2017, the coastal holiday beaches around the Mediterranean and Adriatic were shocked when they had to exchange their shorts for snowshoes. Luca Colonna was intrigued to see it snowing in Porta Cesario, Italy. The typical weather conditions for the region are very mild and not very cold throughout the year. We are not used to seeing snow. It very rarely snows for us. It was an extraordinary event. It's hard to compute snow on a beach and so far south as well. As a meteorologist, think, how did that happen? And as a local, I'm sure they were amazed. One day, we woke up surprised by all the snow. It had snowed during the night. It kept snowing consistently for the following few days, something we are not used to. So we were surprised and amazed. I live about 20 kilometers from the beach, so I took the car despite all the difficulties, as we were not prepared for that kind of snow, so it was very difficult for us. It was snowing a lot that day, and as I got closer to the beach, there was more and more snow. There was Storm Axel across the Baltic states, which caused a lot of flooding. It then gradually drifted its way eastwards. And what that meant, there was a feed of very cold air on its eastern side coming in from the Baltic states and also Russia. The air was frigid, it was so cold. And that flow of air just flowed down towards the Adriatic, across a relatively warm sea towards Italy. We arrived at the beach and we were stunned by all the snow. It was heaven. A fantastic landscape unfolded before our eyes. So the air was really, really cold and it picked up moisture from the warm sea of the Adriatic. And then something called the sea snow effect happened, where the moisture rose into the air. And because the air was sub-zero, you didn't see raindrops, you saw snowflakes. And that snow was dumped on the coastline. It made me and the other people on the beach very emotional. Because it was a very unusual sight. It felt like being in heaven. I'm sure local people in Spain were going, oh my goodness, snow in Italy, we'll never see that well. Cue a week later. In Torre Vieja, Spain, Xavi La Salle found himself equally shocked by the sight of snow. I just uh, woke up and, and suddenly I looked through the window, I, I saw the, the snow. Uh, I said, oh my God, that's incredible. I need to take my camera 
and go downstairs and go to the beach because it uh, is very rare. By then, there was a little low across Italy, so the steering flow was coming in from the northeast. The wind picked up some strength, blew across the Mediterranean Sea. It's the same process again, snow formed, and this time the locals in Spain saw it on their beaches. Uh, this part of Spain is very, very dry. It almost don't grow and everything is, uh, we don't have much vegetation or trees. So it was a little bit uh, like, like a desert, but with snow, which was <laughs> even more, uh, even more strange. It was a little bit like, uh, uh, like a dream, you know? I wonder if this will happen again, but maybe not in my lifetime, <laughs> you know? The weirdest weather can make a brief appearance and disappear as fast as it arrives, as Ken Scott found on his walks around Lake Michigan. We get ice every year here, and we never know to what degree it's going to show itself. And I'm always out hiking along the shorelines to see what, what can be seen. And especially in the wintertime when we get the ice formations, um, one of the things I look for are the ice balls because uh, they are pretty, pretty elusive. Nature is always in a process of movement, moving along. And with ice, that happens as well. So the ice sheet, which basically covered much of the lake, occasionally breaks off with the action of waves. And then these blocks of ice get transported by the water towards the, the lake shore. But what happens in this process, there's a continual freezing and melting of these ice chunks as it moves with the water, and they become eroded. The couple times I've seen them, I've always assumed that uh, I could go back and study them photographically further, and the next day I go back and they're gone. So I've learned that um, when I find them, I have to work them right then because I don't know where they're going to go or where they're going to be next. So rather than having sort of discrete chunks of ice, so they become much more spherical. And with the continual freezing and melting, very soft and these amazing boulders then land on the shoreline. So it really is a case of temperature in the air is below freezing, but because the water is fluid, it's above freezing actually in the water. That's where you get the action of freezing and refreezing. And once they hit the shoreline, all it takes is a temperature to go above freezing and they'll melt. I decided to climb into the water to, to see what these balls were like. Um, I wanted to see how heavy they were, uh, trying to figure out a little bit more about them. And um, it, it was it was interesting getting sloshed around with the balls. It wasn't as dangerous as it looks because the balls are um, they're basically um, slush balls with a, an ice coating. And when I find the ice balls, I, I never know what to expect. And that's part of the fun of looking for them is because you just never know what you're going to find. It's not just random ice balls in the United States or snow surges on our warm beaches that catch us by surprise. In July 2014, Russian Nikita Dudnik painfully found this out in sunny Siberia. When it all started, no one really understood what was happening. There was a strong wind, a gust of wind and hail. At first it hit the water and the roofs. Not everyone understood what was happening. Large hailstones form in really deep and intense cumulonimbus clouds. Cumulo means heap, nimbus means rain bearing. But the key feature of these clouds, and they are absolutely huge, they're the mother of all clouds, and their base may be only 3,000 feet, but they will rise to around 20,000 feet. So they can rise up to six or seven miles into the upper atmosphere. And the key feature of these cumulonimbus clouds is the updrafts and downdrafts. They become violent. Yeah. 
Usually, if it hails in autumn or spring, the hailstones are three to five centimeters across. Here, it was significantly bigger than usual, up to seven centimeters in diameter. I hadn't ever seen this kind of thing before. There are lots of local processes that go on to create these huge clouds so quickly. But certainly um, at a beach during the summer where the currents really get going, the thermals, all it takes is the air to rise into the sky and eventually condensate. And within 10 minutes or so, these small clouds can be huge, overbearing clouds. And it doesn't take much for the processes to get to work within the cloud and then bang, you've got yourself some giant hail. <laughs> When we saw the people on the beach, we noticed injuries to heads, hands, shoulders, all over the body of the people that were hurt by those hailstones. The time went so quick because of a bunch of emotions and scary feelings. It was the only time in my life that I've experienced that kind of natural phenomenon. It was unforgettable. It's going to stick in my memory for a long time. Oklahoma is slap bang in Tornado Alley, the region of the United States which suffers from the most devastating tornadoes, and the El Reno tornado was the widest in recorded history. There it is. The tornado that came through El Reno that day was a big, breathing, furious beast, and uh, one of the biggest I've ever seen. This tornado is like nothing I've ever seen before that or since. There it is, I can see it on the camera. It was incredibly powerful, unpredictable, and deadly. The lightning intensity with the thunderstorm was phenomenal. Uh, lightning strikes uh, almost constantly once the storm got going. Uh, the sky became dark really quick. We turn on the TV and we watch the guys in the helicopters and they're giving live shots of a tornado that's on the ground now, south of El Reno. And this beast was almost impossible to predict. Now, with most tornado outbreaks, they tend to track northeastwards across Tornado Alley. This one didn't. This one was complex and unpredictable. And it tracked southwards at least twice, catching so many people out. The big tornadoes usually move from southwest to northeast. This one was moving northwest to southeast. Once the tornado actually formed, it was something like I've never witnessed before. Uh, the tornado was morphing uh, one tornado, and then there'd be a couple tornadoes at once, and it would move left and then move right. It was awe-inspiring and something I'd never seen before, and quite frankly, became mesmerized by it. So we're talking here supercell development, and it's the extra rotation which allows these secondary vortices to develop. And these are intense, localized areas of low pressure, almost like a vacuum, which sucks everything from around and sprays it up into the main cloud. So we've got lots of processes going on, and most of them are incredibly violent. And all it takes is extremes in temperature and also humidity, so the dry air clashing with the moist air, cold air clashing with the warm air, and you get something which is pretty much a perfect storm. I think a lot of people think that the wind, when it comes through and it's moving in your direction, that the wind is, is blowing from it, but it's actually pulling air in. It's actually drawing air from all around it, and it's sucking it in and then spinning it up. And, uh, and it's extremely loud. Um, yeah, it's a pretty terrifying, if you get too close, it's pretty spooky. I was tracking to the south of the storm, trying to get in behind it, and I was with about three or four of my deputies, and uh, we got into a significant hell storm, and so we were being pelted pretty hard. Or 
were still there and I was still filming the tornado, just completely mesmerized by it. Wow, multi-vortex. There was multiple vortices that, that we were seeing that were being reported and then and then they all kind of just morphed into one big tornado. It's like they all just connected and it, it grew immensely and it was the widest tornado in recorded history. At its widest, it was 2.6 miles long. There was nowhere to run, there was nowhere to hide. And it was the ultimate mega twister because they had multiple vortices and they flayed out in every direction. As the debris starts to rain down on our car, I'm, I'm screaming, you know, duck down, duck down. I don't even remember how long it was. It might have been two minutes, it might have been 30 seconds. The, the whole time when we were getting hit with debris and blinding rain, it was incredibly terrifying and didn't know if we were gonna come out of that alive. It's dangerous to be caught in a tornado, period. With the big ones, you have to be in, an, in a sheltered, secure place. Generally, a well-built structure, concrete's best, below ground is ideal, and put as many walls between you and the outside as possible. That's going to increase your, your, your potential of surviving a tornado. You get an adrenaline rush, it's kind of like being in a high-speed pursuit, knowing that it's very risky, but, uh, you know, fortunately, there's, there's people that sign up to do this. Chris and his fellow deputies were circling the tornado, tracking it, and trying to help anyone caught in its path of destruction, and Greg's college was going to be destroyed. I knew then that our school was in trouble, that we were right in the path of a very, very large EF3 tornado. It's right there, you see it? Storm chasers have to be prepared to get out of danger quick. Go, 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 get the tripod, just try, just try. So typically tornadoes will move from southwest to northeast or, you know, at least move east. Well, this tornado all of a sudden took a hard turn and actually started moving southeast, which blocked our escape route to the south. A tornado which has winds of around 150 to 200 miles an hour has a huge amount of energy entrained within it and releasing that energy in the form of wind, equivalent to one billion watts, which is equivalent of a, a coal-fired power station servicing at least a couple of big cities. But within these mega twisters, the energy is far greater, 40,000 times greater. So we're talking here around 40 trillion watts generated from a supercell system. Yes, unfortunately, sometimes people make bad decisions and uh, they think that they've got time to maybe accelerate and they can get down a particular road before the tornado or the storm crosses and sometimes they're not able to make it. And uh, that's what happened in, in our county. Uh, we had several people that were in automobiles and uh, they miscalculated and they got caught up and ended up as victims. The unpredictability of this tornado was scary. Its vast howling energy took even experienced storm chasers by surprise. You okay? Yeah! You're fine! Don't move! Get down! Duck down! Duck down! Ow! Fred, if you don't go south, we're gonna die! The tornado switched path again, amazingly saving Brandon and his team from certain death. Had the tornado not changed direction, I think it would have been a very different outcome. Uh, or the tornado continuing on the same path that we might not have made it out. Four storm chasers died that day, along with four other people. The huge beer moth of the El Reno tornado wreaked havoc for 40 minutes. The estimated damage was over $50 million. I was devastated. I, I just could not believe the extent of the damage that, that we had suffered. El Reno was lucky. The tornado was 2.6 miles wide, with winds in excess of 295 miles per hour. We were very fortunate, even though we did have the loss of life, that this tornado did not go through a major population area. But luckily, its path avoided a heavily populated part of town so the death toll was limited to eight people. Well, I've seen some pretty bad ones. Um, you know, this, is, this was probably the worst that Canadian County uh, has seen. You have to respect them. 